Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. ARK Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARK. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARK or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARK to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARK Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Welcome to FYI, ARK's weekly podcast on innovation and technology investing. This week's guest is Brian Catanzaro, Vice President of Applied Deep Learning at NVIDIA. Brian built some of the original deep learning libraries that kicked off NVIDIA's AI business. At Baidu, he worked with Andrew Ang and others to develop Deep Speech, an AI system that reached human level accuracy in speech recognition in both Mandarin and English. In 2006, he returned to NVIDIA to lead the AI research effort with a focus on conversational AI and applying AI to computer graphics. We've covered AI from the perspective of many companies on FYI, and I thought with this episode, we'd go back to one of the founding companies that made it happen. Brian gives an inside view of how NVIDIA discovered the AI opportunity, the recent breakthroughs of conversational AI systems, and how NVIDIA views the increasingly competitive field of AI chip startups and cloud companies. All right, Brian, it's so great to have you today. You've been kind of at the driving seat of this whole deep learning revolution for a while. You did the original research at Berkeley, went to Baidu for a couple of years, and now you're back at NVIDIA for your second stint. Give our listeners kind of an overview of throughout this period, how has deep learning changed? When you started your research in university, did you know it was going to be this big? When did you know it was going to blow up? You know, I definitely did not know that it was going to be this important back when I was a grad student. I mean, it wasn't obvious to anybody back then. In fact, when I was a graduate student studying machine learning, my professors actually encouraged me not to work on deep learning because back then, you know, 2008 timeframe, deep learning was an old idea that didn't work. And, you know, it really caught everybody by surprise. Well, not everybody, but many people by surprise in 2012, when, you know, Alex Krzyzewski's ImageNet results came in so much better than all of the other algorithms that people had been working on for this image classification problem. And that was definitely the moment when me and a lot of other people in the community started rethinking our positions about deep learning. You know, before then, I was mostly working on things like support vector machines and, you know, other kinds of machine learning algorithms. And so it was such a big jump with ImageNet. That was the moment for me when I thought, wow, I should really work on this. And at the time when ImageNet came out, I was actually working at NVIDIA Research, trying to figure out ways of making machine learning run better on NVIDIA processors and make libraries for machine learning on GPUs. So when that happened, it became kind of obvious to me that there was an opportunity for NVIDIA to really jump into this space. So I I built this prototype for a library for deep learning computations on the GPU. And that became KUDNN, which is now, you know, one of the most important libraries that we have for deploying deep learning on GPUs. I see. When did NVIDIA as an organization and maybe Jensen really kind of come to terms with the fact that deep learning was going to be the next killer HPC app, or maybe even just the next killer app for the GPU period from the research community felt it, but when did NVIDIA management or, or Jensen feel it? You know, I think I published a paper in 2013 at ICML on large HPC scaling of, at that time it was unsupervised image models. And it kind of attracted a lot of attention because we were able to replace a thousand servers from the work that Google had done the year before with three servers using GPUs. And of course, some of that was because GPUs are faster. Some of it is because we used more efficient software. You know, Google in their prior paper had, there's this like scale out software, like basically Hadoop, you know, kind of MapReduce style computations that were in vogue back then that were not HPC oriented, that were very costly. So part of the speed up was better hardware. Part of it was just that we took an HPC approach. And so we, you know, people were really impressed by the speed ups that we got. And that started driving a lot more attention to my little research project than NVIDIA decided to productize. 
I started spending time with Jensen and with other leaders at NVIDIA up in management in late 2013. That was really when like all of a sudden the attention of NVIDIA management was like starting to be completely laser focused on AI. And Jensen, you know, Jensen jumped on it immediately. Like it was clear to him from the beginning, maybe clearer to him than it was to me, actually, <laughs> that this was going to change the world forever. I think this is one of Jensen's great strengths is that he's such a visionary. When he understands where the future is going to go, he's fully committed and he just starts turning the whole company towards it. And so that was that was really exciting to see. And I feel like, you know, the rest, I guess, as they say, is history. You're the vice president of applied research for AI at NVIDIA. Is there someone else doing kind of theoretical? Give us a kind of a sense of what is the organization behind NVIDIA? How many teams are there working on different kinds of problems? How maybe you work with Ian's group and so on? It is a moderately big company. You know, there's somewhere around 12,000 people at NVIDIA. So there's a lot of different groups doing a lot of different things. My team is focused on applying AI, which in my mind means building prototypes that use AI to do things to help NVIDIA. So what we do is research in the sense that we're building something new. That's the state of AI in 2019 is that in order to apply it, you're still doing something new basically for every application. It's not a completely standardized turn the crank engineering exercise in order to apply AI to a new problem. You have to go invent it. So it's research, but it's research that's focused on applications rather than theory. We are somewhat less concerned with academic novelty, but completely concerned on application novelty. You know, like, is there some new capability that we can provide NVIDIA because of AI? And NVIDIA has seen how AI has transformed our customers' businesses in so many ways. That's why our AI business has been growing over the past few years. And so it's very natural for NVIDIA to ask the question, well, you know, how can we benefit from AI as well? Like, how can we make our products more useful, um, have more capabilities, provide more value to our customers through AI. And so that's what my team focuses on. Now, NVIDIA is also, as you might remember, a very densely connected, flat organization. So teams work together across org chart boundaries every day. My team, I report to Jonah Albin, who is in charge of GPU architecture. So his organization actually determines what a GPU is constructed out of and does some of the software libraries that run on top of that. And so I work closely with people in Jonah's organization that are trying to figure out how to make GPUs better for deep learning in the future. I think one of the things that is very important when you make an accelerator is that you have to be so intentional about what you accelerate because there are very, very many different kinds of workloads, very many different kinds of AI workloads, very many different kinds of deep learning workloads. And there's a lot of system implications as well. You know, how does the accelerator interact with the interconnect as well as the host CPUs and the storage and, and all of this really matters. If what you care about is end user speed up, you know, how can we accelerate the research process, which is primarily how we add value. So it's, it's really useful to the GPU architecture organization to work with an applied AI organization because we're we're kind of proxies for what a lot of our customers do. You know, we're not just training models of the past. We are inventing models of the future. And there's a difference. You know, if all you do is make a chip that runs really fast on the models of the past, that's not necessarily going to guarantee that you actually help researchers solve the problems of the future. So that's that's one of the things that that my team does. One of the reasons that we are where we are in the organization is to help make sure that GPs of the future are even better for deep learning. Do you work with uh, large enterprises uh, as well as maybe the NVIDIA Inception program, which is to kind of help startups build AI products? My team is focused on NVIDIA's own needs. Of course, we have friends that work at other companies and at startups. And, you know, occasionally I'll give talks. Uh, last week I was talking with a bunch of um, Inception partners. So I do a little bit of that. But I would say that my mission is primarily about NVIDIA and how to make NVIDIA and NVIDIA's products better with AI, less about how to make our customers' products better with AI. 
And then to the other part of your question, we work really closely with um, other research organizations. So there are more pure AI research organizations in Bill Daly's main NVIDIA research organization. Um, we work really closely with them. There's also more applied groups such as the groups in um, self-driving that we work with. And of course, we work with people in Ian's group that are building enterprise software to make sure that all of our algorithms uh, plug into kind of the things that they're building as well. Gotcha. Given your current research, what are you seeing that's most exciting that can be taken from maybe the cutting edge of research that would really help NVIDIA itself either improve its businesses or open up new business lines? So there's two main projects that I'm really, really excited about right now for NVIDIA. The first one is what we call conversational AI. And you've probably heard a lot of people talking about this. This is bigger than just NVIDIA. I think every large tech company and every startup these days is, is excited about the prospects of being able to solve problems through language. You know, we have so much better speech synthesis, speech recognition, and then, of course, our natural language understanding capabilities over the past year have just really undergone a dramatic shift. Um, and so that is really inspiring a lot of investment and a lot of growth in, in conversational AI. NVIDIA itself has a lot of places to deploy conversational AI. And so uh, my team is, is working on that. So, for example, like question answering systems and so forth. So that's the first area that I think is, is really exciting. The second area, which is maybe a little bit more specific to NVIDIA, but one that is very important to my team is graphics. So NVIDIA is, I think, more than any other company at the intersection of graphics and artificial intelligence. And we believe that there are huge opportunities to revolutionize graphics by using artificial intelligence to do a lot of the traditional rendering. So we have actually a prototype product out there right now called DLSS, which is integrated into a few games. I would say, so it launched basically with the Turing family back uh, in 2018. I would say that, you know, the first iteration of DLSS is definitely a zero to one style product in the sense that no one ever in the history of humanity had ever been crazy enough to try to use AI for real time, high resolution, high fidelity graphics before. And so it was definitely the first of its kind. I think we've learned a lot of things from it. I'm very excited about the research that we've done since then. And, you know, hopefully in the not too distant future, you and the rest of the world will be able to see, you know, really the increased capabilities that AI can bring to real time graphics. On to conversational AI for a moment. You worked for a long time at Baidu, which had a focus on language as well. Deep Speech 2 famously came out of Baidu. Um, and we've had some of the earliest AI breakthroughs were in the fields of kind of real-time translation from Microsoft and so on. What is so different today in the kind of 18, 2019 era that's brought out this new phrase of conversational AI versus kind of the previous systems of maybe the kind of first gen Alexa or like the Facebook approaches with Messenger? Yeah. Well, the dream of conversational AI goes back all the way to Turing, right? I mean, really like, you know, what is the Turing test other than conversational AI? So it's an old dream. It's been around for, you know, 60 years. And we've been making a lot of progress recently. You know, I would say that the thing that's happened in the past year that's really revolutionized the space has been large scale language modeling, the type that you might have heard called BERT and other models that are related to it. The thing that's really amazing about these models is that we train them on large amounts of text, which means we don't need a lot of human intervention in order to create a labeled data set. We just need to create large data sets of text and train a language model that is able to understand the interrelation between words and you know the way that sentences and paragraphs kind of build up structures of meaning. Then we're able to use those language models to actually solve language understanding tasks. It turns out if you have a model that's very good at understanding connections in language, then you also have a model that's very good at answering questions about language. So for example, there's an academic benchmark called Glue that's been around for a while. You can look at the accuracy on the Glue benchmark. It was increasing at a very steady rate up until last year when BERT came out and absolutely revolutionized that field. And the GLUE benchmarks are a set of, you know, natural language understanding benchmarks, um, things like entailment, pronoun disambiguation. It's kind of like a, a language test that you might take in school as a child. And these kinds of things have been traditionally just so hard for computers to understand because they really rely on sophisticated understanding of meaning and context. And, you know, with the current results that we have on these benchmarks today, we actually, you know, we've seen results from Google and Facebook and Microsoft that are all better than 
average untrained humans at these tasks. Now, there's obviously a spectrum of human performance, right? Like if you study for a test like this, you can do better on it. And, you know, some people have higher natural aptitude for these kinds of puzzle language tests than others. But the fact that we now have models that surpass average untrained human accuracy on these kinds of language understanding tests is a real breakthrough for the world. And, you know, we see this breakthrough reflected in deployments of this technology across the world. So, you know, Google has talked very openly about how these BERT models have revolutionized search. Yesterday, or very recently, Microsoft came out with a blog post that said, you know, they're using these BERT models and it has dramatically improved their search results on Bing. And, you know, all of this is happening very fast. It's, it seems like, you know, there's a new paper approximately every two weeks that just really changes the field. And so I would say that the thing that's changed is we have better models and we have just much more momentum right now on understanding natural language tasks. Now, I do want to temper this enthusiasm a little bit. Like I said, understanding language is an old problem. Like, you know, people have been dreaming about this for decades and, you know, fully being able to process language in all of the ways that humans can do remains a very difficult task. And I think it's going to take many more years of research. You know, people have very sophisticated language understandings. Like, for example, there are people that get PhDs in literature. They spend, you know, 25 years studying in order to be able to understand language at the level that they do and to be able to synthesize language at the level that they do. That kind of specialized, very deep understanding of meaning and, and language, you know, is going to be far away for a long time. And there's there's so many different fields, right? There's so many different types of languages, so many different subfields, so many different specialized vocabularies and specialized meanings, you know, the language that we use in engineering to describe our work is very different from the language that, you know, you might hear in an elementary school. So because language is so broad and, and applies to basically everything that humans do, actually figuring out how to solve language as a problem, I think is going to take a lot more research. But the thing that's so exciting about today's language models is that we are seeing meaningful progress on a lot of very practical language tasks like search and question answering that, you know, have really been important but difficult for so long. And the data collection process is so much simpler. This is not kind of the first wave of deep learning where you have to literally spend a lot of money on, on humans to label the correct answer. This is just taking raw Wikipedia entries in a lot of the cases and just using that directly to train the model, which, which really takes away a lot of that burden on data. I agree with that, but I also disagree with it. So the, the thing is that data still remains one of the biggest bottlenecks to progress in this space. Hmm. And, you know, my team, we've also been working on large scale language modeling. For example, we have trained an 8 billion parameter GPT-2 model. It's, you know, 24 times bigger than BERT. And, you know, it is much better as a language model than the smaller models that people have had before. But when we first trained the model, actually, it didn't perform better than the pre-existing models. And that's because we trained it on the same data sets that the other models were trained on. And it turns out that that very large model essentially just memorized the specifics of that training set. Mm -hmm. And it didn't actually learn anything new about oh, language. It, it overfit on so, those. <laughs> yeah. So in order for us to actually transform, you know, a bigger model into better language model accuracy, we had to create a bigger data set, which then involved a lot of curation because it turns out if you just download text from the internet, there's a lot of stuff in there that's not actual language. Like for example, emojis sure. or tables of numbers, you know, people draw ASCII art and that kind of thing totally confuses a neural network. If you're trying to teach a neural network how to recognize the concepts in English and then you throw like an ASCII art picture of a whale in the middle of all that text, that's like the end. It turns out it's actually hard to find all the ASCII art and all the tables and all of the emojis or or maybe you want to keep some of the emojis yeah. but maybe you want to throw away some of the other ones right like that's this is actually a difficult problem so i would say that the data collection problem still remains one of the fundamental limiting factors for the development of artificial intelligence but maybe what's changed is that we're doing it at a different level of abstraction whereas before with ImageNet, we actually had to have a person touch every single picture now what we do is we spend a lot of time writing scripts that comb over large data sets and you know progressively increase the quality of that data set so it, it is more leveraged and more productive 
Bird is a much more complex model than what came before. And that creates, I guess, business opportunities for NVIDIA, both on the training and inference side. How much more demanding is it to train a BERT model versus the kind of prior approaches? And what about at the inference workload? Do you see this as a kind of a large opportunity for the cloud providers to really scale out some of these services where they were using more basic models before? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So one of the things about large transformer networks is that they scale really well. Computationally, they scale really well. Their building blocks are quite simple. It's primarily just large matrix multiplies. And they scale really well on GPUs. They also scale really well across multiple GPUs. And so it becomes possible to train very large models. Another thing that's really great about them is that the optimization process for these large transformer models is actually simpler and I would say more reliable than what we had before. So before the advent of these attention-based models, what we typically used was recurrent models like LSTMs. And the problem with LSTMs is that and and other recurrent models is that they tended to lose coherence. They weren't able to remember things over a long period of time because the way that they consumed the data was one token at a time in a sequential fashion. And all of the past history of all of the things that the model had seen before, for example, in a particular sentence, needed to be remembered in a single vector. So it kind of compressed everything into a single vector. But that's actually very difficult from a optimization perspective because we're asking the network to do something uh, somewhat unnatural. The thing about the transformer models is that they're fundamentally based on attention, which means that they have random access to the input. So when you give it a sentence, instead of having to go through the sentence token by token and remember everything that you saw before, what the model does is builds up its understanding of the meaning of the sentence by being able to focus its attention step by step on different parts of the of the sentence. And the memory then is actually sort of integrating the things that it's learned over the different places where it focused attention as it processes the, the sentence. And this random access characteristic makes the training process a lot more stable and actually a lot more scalable. We can make the models much larger and then still successfully train them. You know, people had a lot of problems successfully training large recurrent models. They just didn't optimize very well. Sort of the machine learning algorithms didn't work as well. I feel like the transformers have really opened up new opportunities for very large scale language modeling. We just see better and better results. So that's on the training side. On the inference side, yeah, I mean, it's it's a huge opportunity. We're very excited. Um, I referenced the Microsoft blog already, but if you haven't seen it, you should go take a look where they they described how the only way that they were able to deploy BERT inside of Bing Search was to use, you know, several thousand virtual machine instances with um, V100 GPUs. And they they were able to route, you know, these huge volumes of, of search queries through these GPUs and serve them with low latency. And that that was instrumental to being able to deploy this technology. So that's that's obviously a big opportunity for us. And the other thing about conversational AI that's really interesting is that when you put in speech as well as text, then you have a complicated pipeline that has, you know, multiple different kinds of models. You have speech recognition, you have natural language understanding, you have speech synthesis, and all of these things need to work together. They need to be fast. They need to have low latency. And that really makes the inference procedure a lot more interesting from a computational perspective and you know from Nvidia's point of view I think means that it's you know an even more exciting opportunity. I was looking at some of the open AI charts they put out on the, kind of the complexity of how AI has changed over the years and it's just grown dramatically it's grown like 10x every year for the last couple of years and it struck me that the kind of language models are far more complex both to train and to infer on than image classification models uh, how much more complex is something like BERT which is used for language versus ResNet for say image classification Yeah, so one way to think about the compute intensity of training BERT is to compare it with other models like ResNet 50. ResNet 50 is the most commonly cited model for image classification. And these days we can train on one DGX2, we can train ResNet 50 in less than an hour. It's taken a lot of work to get to that point. But we can also train BERT in about the same time, less than an hour, but doing so takes over a thousand GPUs. So it takes basically a hundred times more GPUs to train BERT in the same amount of time as it takes to train ResNet 50. 
On the training hardware, you know, previously when we when we're talking about training neural nets, Alex Krzyzewski's machine was just a single PC with two GPUs inside, and solely we've had you know DGX one with eight and sixteen GPUs. To what degree is training done on single node machines and and uh, like in, across industry versus maybe multi node machines? It seems like Nvidia is spending a lot more effort and, and attention on on kind of the interconnects with, of course, the Mellanox acquisition. When you work with, I guess, both internal and external projects, is it basically a multi node problem? Is there still any point in thinking about single node performance? There absolutely is point in thinking about single node performance. I would say that. There's a spectrum of computational needs, just as there's a spectrum of different kinds of businesses, you know, like there's small businesses, there's medium businesses, there's large businesses, you know, we at NVIDIA want to have the best solutions for everyone. So we definitely do care about the single node stuff. However, I would say that the very exciting cutting edge industrial machine learning these days is multi-node for sure. You know, I think that that's going to increase, you know, there's always a sort of a resistance to using more hardware. Obviously, it can be more expensive, although it doesn't have to be. So one of the things about using multiple nodes is that if your scaling efficiency is very high, essentially what you do is you take the latency of training the model and you compress it. But if you think about the opportunity cost of training that model, if the scaling efficiency is high, then you really haven't spent the opportunity cost because although you you used a bigger machine, you used it for a smaller amount of time. And so the overall like aggregate amount of machine hours that you use stays relatively the same as you scale, as long as your scaling efficiency is good, but that requires good software, good interconnect, good systems. And that's one of the reasons why NVIDIA is investing so heavily in all those things. The better that we make the scaling, then the more value that we can provide to our customers. Again, like, you know, the point of accelerating deep learning training is to help researchers iterate on their ideas more quickly. You know, every day researchers wake up with an idea, but how do they know if it's good? This is an empirical field. We have to test it, which means we have to write code. We then have to train a model and then we have to evaluate it. And then that gives us new ideas and we kind of iterate on that. So the training time is an important part of that cycle. And that's, you know, why speed matters when we're training these models. The coding time is also part of this cycle. And that's something that I think gets overlooked a lot in the discussions about hardware for artificial intelligence is that, of course, people focus on the speed, but then there's this question of like, well, how long did it take for you to write that software in order to train that model? And um, one of the things that's really unique about NVIDIA's software stack is that it's so flexible that researchers are able to very quickly prototype their ideas and train at speed. It's a very unique combination of flexibility and speed. And that's important for researchers because, you know, if you manage to increase the training speed, but by doing so, you've increased also the amount of time that it takes to write very customized, very special code in order to make your model fit on the hardware in a particular way, then that actually could be a loss um, in terms of research productivity. So you kind of need, well, you absolutely need both. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we, we care so much about software. Yeah, that's like human training time that's been neglected in in the equation. Let's talk about software and frameworks for a moment. You know, for a while it seemed like TensorFlow was becoming more and more popular, and we we may end up in a situation where everyone is using TensorFlow. But it, it seems like the fragmentation hasn't really consolidated. Everyone still has every company still at least has their flavor, whether it's MXNet or or you know my CNTK or Baidu with Paddle Paddle. Everyone has their own little flavor, and they're still progressing and building that up. And PyTorch, of course, is. Uh, um, the Facebook-backed framework is still as popular as ever. What are you seeing? More popular than ever. Yes, <laughs> more popular than ever. Well, we'll see how TensorFlow 2 does, but what are you seeing out there among the community kind of um, using these well, different frameworks? Community, I actually think that PyTorch has won. I mean, if you look at submissions to NeurIPS 2019, for example, PyTorch totally dominated TensorFlow. Oh. Now, TensorFlow is a good framework and you know, there's lots of people that are very happy with it. So, so I don't want to say too many negative things about TensorFlow, but I think the thing that has really attracted people to PyTorch has been the flexibility. I mean, we talked about this need for researchers to iterate on their code. Feedback from my team of researchers is that that process is just much more efficient in PyTorch than it is in TensorFlow. And that's why the vast majority of projects in my team are built with PyTorch is because the researchers prefer it. And my team isn't alone. I mean, that's why if you, like I said, if you look at the top AI conferences today, most of the papers are actually being invented using PyTorch. Now, I think TensorFlow has some great advantages, especially when it comes to industrial AI. You know, Google invests a lot in TensorFlow and, you know, there's some 
things that it's that's actually really good at. But again, like uh, the the flexibility, the simplicity of PyTorch, the familiarity, you know. Programming PyTorch feels like programming Python, mm-hmm. uh, which is great because that's what programmers like. You know, programming TensorFlow feels a little bit like you're you've entered into a different realm. You know, <laughs> like you can't use the straightforward Python control flow constructs that you know and love. You have to use different ones. And you know, so of course with TensorFlow two, Google's trying to make TensorFlow look more like PyTorch. The interesting question is going to be whether they can do that while still keeping the things that made TensorFlow 1.0 so special. And uh, I don't know, we'll see how it goes. But as for my team, we're a PyTorch team. Can you go to production with PyTorch or is it mostly a research tool? Oh, people go to production with PyTorch all the time. I mean, obviously Facebook is a pretty big proponent of production with PyTorch. They have a lot of important models that they deploy with PyTorch. We also, with a lot of the things that we do, it's all focused on PyTorch. Um, And if you look at the MLPerf training results, you know, PyTorch can actually be really fast uh, for training. For inference, you know, I feel like inference is always going to be a little bit more fragmented because you really care about um, some different problems. You care a little bit less about research flexibility and you care a lot more about forward propagation speed. Uh, And so people tend to use, you know, different software for um, deployment. But, you know, the path to go from PyTorch models and actually deploy them, uh, I think is pretty well trodden. And, you know, it's something that a lot of people do. Okay. When I look at the landscape right now, as we're talking, uh, supercomputing 2019 is happening and all the AI chip competitors are out there doing their presentations. A year or two ago, they were still mostly doing PowerPoint or they were stealth. Uh, This year, we have some actual hardware, physical hardware and customer announcements on the floor. I'm sure NVIDIA is very, you know, Jensen takes competition very seriously. When you look at the field, which company strikes you as doing, you know, pretty good work and with reasonable solutions? Um, how do you feel like NVIDIA's position is changing kind of with all these competitors coming out? Well, the first thing that I, I like to remind people is that when NVIDIA was founded 26 years ago, there were probably about 50 companies that were making GPUs. And the initial years of NVIDIA were really formative for the company, obviously. Uh, one of the things that, you know, made NVIDIA successful is just this relentless drive to compete and to build absolutely the best accelerator. And, you know, the interesting thing about NVIDIA is that the same people who did that and, you know, prevailed against a a big field of 50 different companies making GPUs 25 years ago, those same people are still running NVIDIA today. They still have that same competitive drive and now they are focused on AI. And so I think that that kind of gets overlooked. Uh, You know, the startups like to say things like, you know, GPUs are old technology, it was invented for something else, and now it's being repurposed for AI. I mean, that would be true if NVIDIA wasn't changing what a GPU is, but actually we, we have. You know, Volta was really the first GPU that was built for artificial intelligence, and I think Volta really took the world by surprise. You know, um, I don't think that it was a really great day for a lot of those startups when they realized that their competition had now gotten an order of magnitude faster than they thought it was going to be. And so... That kind of dynamic, I think, is not done yet. Uh, We are very excited about the future of our products at NVIDIA. We're very excited about artificial intelligence. We're making huge bets, and uh, we'll see how it goes. Now, having said that, of course, we we take the competition very seriously, and I expect there's going to be more of it. In fact, I'm a little bit surprised that it's taken so long. There's been a lot of companies for a long time that have said that they were going to compete with us in this space. It's actually surprising to me that it's taken so long for them to actually show up and, and turn some things on. Um, having said that, one of the things that you know I'm really looking forward to is um, sort of more honest comparisons between you know the things that exist and the things that these new companies are are proposing. There's been a lot of, I would say, very misleading comparisons that are being made. The funny thing is that there actually exists a forum to help people make fair comparisons about machine learning hardware. It's called MLPerf. Mm -hmm. Um, And it would be amazing if some of these organizations would submit to MLPerf. The reason that we have invested in MLPerf so much is that we absolutely believe that it's important to understand the technical details 
of how to train these models and and perform comparisons uh, in a way that you know actually reflects sensibly on the process. So you know, so we'll we'll see. I I feel like one piece of advice that I I guess I would give you and other people that are interested in this from a financial space is that unless some particular performance claim has been made in a forum like MLPerf where all of the details are public and clearly disclosed, the comparison is not very informative because there exist probably a thousand different knobs that can significantly influence the outcome of a comparison uh, that are not being disclosed in most of the comparisons that we see outside of forums like MLPerf. And that really makes the comparison not very informative. If what you're trying to understand is, you know, the actual business of training neural networks, things like your learning rate schedule, for example, can completely dominate the hardware. So like you can make you can make the same hardware 100 times faster or 100 times slower if you choose the wrong learning rate schedule or if you change the accuracy at which you're converging or you know there's there's like there's a very large number of these knobs and that's why for example MLPerf was created. So, you know, so I'm looking forward to seeing some of these other organizations submit fair comparisons to MLPerf in the same way that we do already and you know, we'll see where that goes. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, I spent my first job basically benchmarking graphics cards for video games. And even then, that was a simpler problem and, and there was ways of getting to very different results. And AI is, is just a, such an incredibly more complex problem. And I've been trying to make sense of the benchmarks and uh, there's just not enough disclosures. I think there's one, just not enough. And yeah. another thing that's really important that I would highlight again for you and other financially interested people is that a lot of the things that a lot of these startups are making cannot actually run the models that we care about as a research community. Things like batch norm, for example, fundamental to architectures like ResNet. Some of the architectures that are coming out these days can't actually support batch norm efficiently. Well, that's an interesting question. You know, so of course a startup can say, well, just don't use batch norm. You're right? referring to Cerebrus here? But this is a question, right? Do they have the right to dictate to researchers what kind of models researchers can use. Now, personally, I've been on an anti-batch norm crusade for like five years. I mean, <laughs> not five, I guess four years. I've been on an anti-batch norm crusade for like four years since it came out because it has like problematic aspects for hardware. The thing is, though, that it's so darn useful. You know, like my team uses it in a lot of our models and, and it's, you know, it's widely used in, in many other models because it actually provides benefits. So, you know, if a startup comes out and says things like, well, you know, we have the most cutting edge hardware but you can only train models that we support, then that's a, a red flag for me. Because again, like the point of hardware for machine learning is to enable researchers to invent the future. It should not be to constrain researchers and it should be the opposite. It should be to inspire researchers. So there's things like batch norm that are problematic. And then also large scale models. You know, a lot of these startups are coming out with architectures that don't have memory. And, uh, you know, memory is a good thing. Like there's a reason that we have memory. Like, of course, all of us would love to make chips that don't need memory attached to it because it's a pain and like, you know, it's expensive and it uses power. And then anyway, there's all these integration questions and like, wouldn't it be great if we didn't have memory? Well, the thing is that people tried this, you know, like there's been computers without memory a long time ago, like the transputer from the 1980s, which came from the UK actually. And these architectures that people invent, they always make the claim, well, if you don't have enough memory on the chip, then you can just use more chips, which is an interesting claim. Uh, it didn't work for the transputer. People tried it back in the 80s, but it turns out the software for doing that is very difficult to create. And conversely, like if you allow yourself to use multiple chips with memory attached, like for example, use 512 GPUs like we did to train Megatron, you can get some really amazing results that way as well. And so, so I feel like that's also a big question mark for me. You know, there, there's a lot of these startups that are saying, hey, we've invented a new thing, a computer without memory. And it's like, oh, well, that thing existed a long time ago and we decided it didn't work. What has changed? And, you know, they will say things like, well, AI is a different kind of workload. It has different constraints. We're able to understand the problem in a way that maybe the transputer wasn't in the 1980s. And perhaps that's the case, but I remain a skeptic. And again, the, my skepticism is primarily because of my perspective as a researcher. I believe that the point of these platforms should be to empower researchers, not to constrain them. And I, you know, for example, Megatron 
our Megatron model is much too big to fit on any of these chips that don't have memory. And so, of course, you would need to scale to like extremely huge numbers of these other chips. There's questions about scalability. There's questions about financial feasibility. There's questions about like whether or not you can even share a computer that requires you to use so many chips in a way that's fair, you know, because again, like the way that researchers work, it's not like every researcher has a dedicated computer. These computers are too expensive. They need to be shared. How do you do that when you're the only way that you can train a model involves monopolizing a large fraction of the computer in a way that's not virtualizable, not shareable, and also places huge burdens on the software. So I have a lot of skepticism about a lot of the things that a lot of these companies are doing. Now we'll see, like I think NVIDIA welcomes the competition, like we have that fighting spirit that we had back during the GPU wars at, at NVIDIA's founding. And you know we're ready to take on whatever new challenges the next few years might bring. Brian is too modest to name names, but when he mentions the batch norm problem, he's, it's uh, Cerebrus who's really um, showing the way there with, with kind of a batch norm free approach. And from memory, it's, it's really GraphCore, which is uh, out of the UK that's, that's doing a OSRAM on chip approach. So those are some interesting approaches and we'll see how they go. But um, among the competitors, I guess I definitely, you know, I was there, I was actually a reporter when covering the, the 90s graphics card wars. One thing that strikes me different about the competitive landscape this time, and that makes it maybe difficult for just sheer audacity and perseverance to win out, is that the nature of competition has shifted. You're no longer competing against just other chip makers and chip designers. The customer basically now goes to the cloud to acquire these training and inference resources. And these cloud providers, whether it's Google and Amazon, have the competency and the motivation. And and in Google's case, they've actually built their own silicon and vertically integrated in-house. You know, I did a presentation on AI competition and AI chips earlier in the year. And I said, kind of cloud competition is a competition you can't really win against because they control kind of who they buy from. And I think probably the most competent competition NVIDIA has faced is from Google with its uh, in-house TPUs. They were pretty modest in the beginning with saying, hey, you know, we support TPUs, GPUs, any kind of processors. But now when I go to their product page, they're more kind of upfront and saying TPUs will offer 27 times the performance at about the same cost. Have you played around with kind of their TPU solutions, it seems quite scalable and I'm seeing more papers come out with it. How do you feel like uh, NVIDIA fares against this kind of cloud competition? Yeah. I mean, I think the TPU is a very respectable project. I don't know if you noticed, I, I thought it was really funny because when Google invented the TPU, they talked about it as a custom processor for AI, not like the GPU. But then of course, recently there was some announcements from some startups and technology reporters said, well, the TPU is actually just like a GPU, but from Google, you know, it's not really a custom processor for AI. It's really just like a GPU. I thought that was really funny. To this question of like, you know, how do people use them? I, I think TPUs are useful. I think people do use them. I think, you know, the cost question is an interesting one because, you know, the TPU is not for sale. Nobody actually knows what a TPU costs. And of course, the costs of developing the TPU are not public, right? So when we price our GPUs, we're doing so to invest in the future, right? Like our GPU is a self-sustaining business. So this question about cost, you know, Google's a, a big company. They have a lot of resources. They can do a lot of things. But I would submit that marketing material from them might not be the right way to evaluate the cost comparison. The thing that, that we do have to compare GPUs and TPUs is MLPerf. You know, and NVIDIA and Google both submit to MLPerf. And MLPerf historically was actually started by Google. It was a place that Google wanted to kind of show off the power of the TPU. And, uh, you know, MLPerf has turned out to be actually really great for NVIDIA. It turns out that our GPUs perform amazingly in MLPerf, both for training and for inference. If you look chip for chip, a GPU is still faster than a TPU on all of the benchmarks on MLPerf. Perhaps for uh, ResNet 50, that might be the only one where the GPU is slightly slower. But, um, you know, it's, it's actually really remarkable from my point of view that NVIDIA was able to build a general purpose GPU with custom AI hardware and ship it in 2017 and compete and actually beat chip for chip a custom AI processor two years later. To me, that's a really remarkable achievement and it speaks well to the way that NVIDIA co-optimizes the hardware and the software for AI. And I think that we're gonna see you know, continued improvement as we continue to invest for the future. Okay. 
I want to switch gears and just kind of talk about NVIDIA's efforts with autonomous driving for a second. NVIDIA, I think, has an office out here in New Jersey, uh, and, and you have a few cars on the road, kind of, uh, at least you published some papers maybe two years ago on imitation learning. Um, what is NVIDIA's approach in kind of the autonomy space? Are you trying to build kind of your own software stack? And what is the kind of rationale for having a car and, and actually experimenting with kind of building the, the software when I think initially yeah. it was more a, a, a hardware you know, solution? So, from, so NVIDIA has a lot of different things going on. I think the efforts in imitation learning that you know about in New Jersey have been well publicized. And so they're kind of at the top of people's mind, but the self-driving effort at NVIDIA is broader and we're definitely not wedded at NVIDIA to only using imitation learning for self-driving. Sometimes people have that misunderstanding. But we do think that imitation learning is a valuable technology to have when we're thinking about how to construct self-driving vehicles, along with other things. Now, to this question of like, why do we do it? Well, from my point of view, self-driving is a, a huge opportunity for NVIDIA. It's a big opportunity in terms of training because you know it's going to require extremely sophisticated ai and that's going to be trained somewhere and we hope that it is trained on on our products it's a big opportunity for inference you know a lot of self-driving cars these days have a trunk full of gpus so we love that we we love to see you know our gpus changing the world and being used in in new ways to unlock value for everyone so it's it's definitely something that we'd like to succeed now i think that we take a, a kind of a sustaining approach that we engage with a lot of different companies at a lot of different business models with a lot of different sort of levels of abstraction. We work with car companies, we work with tier ones, we work with startups, we work with mobility providers, we work with component providers. I mean, we work with basically everyone. And what we'd like to do is make sure that our platform is valuable to all of the people that are working on self-driving. To that end, I think that our efforts in building up software for self-driving are incredibly valuable because, you know, every customer has a different balance of work that they would like to do themselves versus work that they would like to just sort of pick up and use. And it's so much more valuable to show up with a platform that has software libraries that can handle all sorts of different problems in self-driving rather than just show up with a chip and say, hey, we have an awesome chip. It has a lot of tops. When you show up and you have libraries that actually perform the work uh, that's necessary, then it's it's such a more valuable starting point for the customer. They may decide that they need to customize the models, for example, that, that our models aren't good enough for the particular kinds of tasks that they need to perform because they know more about the work that they're doing. And that's great. We are totally happy to help them do that. In fact, we'd be happy to sell them a bunch of GPUs or of time on, on GPU cloud somewhere that they could train their own models and we actually help them do that. So working with NVIDIA for self-driving because of the work we do to develop our own software for self-driving is so much more valuable to our customers than if we just showed up with a chip and said, hey, here's a chip. It has a lot of tops. You can do with it whatever you'd like. Because we have the software, it's a much better starting position for all of the different companies that are working in this space. Gotcha. Uh, Brian, you're a researcher at heart, so I thought I'd close with a question that's uh, more theoretical on the research side. There's a huge debate on the in the academic community about whether the current deep learning approach will continue to scale and uh, make meaningful progress towards artificial general intelligence, or will we need some kind of new breakthrough or maybe um, approaches between different disciplines of AI to get there? What is your take? Do you think we can scale the current approaches to deep learning to something like AGI, or do you think we need some qualitative uh, breakthrough? I don't believe that just scaling today's models will give us AGI. I think we're going to need more than that. However, I do believe that scaling today's models provides more and more value as we do it. And so we're going to continue to see people scaling these models and continue to see more value from doing so. I think there's still a big dot, 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 though, until we get to artificial general intelligence. And I, I don't know what that looks like. And I don't, I don't think anybody does. I think that's the exciting thing about AI is that we have a lot more to learn. That's awesome. Brian, it's been so wonderful talking to you. Thank you for spending the time with us at ARC FYI. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. That's it for this week. You can find the full ARC team on Twitter. We'll catch you next week. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results.
Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions, and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements. <laughs>